Okay, so uh, first thing for this class, there is an independent project. The independent project is optional. And you have a few options. The first option is you can basically do the game 2048 in C. All right? And this is what it looks like. So if I go over here to my IDE, So you may recall, like, a while ago, there was this game called 2048. I got this unblocked for everybody, by the way. Yay. <laughs> so you got a new game. I said it was for school. Um, so you can, if you click the up arrow and then to the right, it gets, you see, I'm going to click up, and then they combine. And if I click up again, then they combine again. And if I click left, so this is basically, so to the right, down, to the left, up, down, up, left, 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 up. So you can combine numbers and make them bigger. So that's 2048, okay? Um, now, prepare to be underwhelmed. Um, I did this in... Uh, in C. So this is kind of like what you could you can do this in C. So here's my move. I use W, A, S, and D. So if I hit D, you see how they slide. It's two slides over and then a new one comes in. If I hit S for down, then they combine to make the four. If I hit D to go to the right and then down and then down again, so it makes an eight. So this is all implemented in C. So this is I won't lie, this is a lot of fun. This is a fun project to do. Um, totally doable. And I created a page with the assignment here. And all the information is here on how to do this game. And some of the rules and everything else. So if you want to do an independent project and you want to do something kind of fun, do 2048. Totally doable. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that you can do is you can do a piece set that we didn't have time to do. This is a CS50 one, but it involves music. And it's really neat. You, it uses sheet music, and it creates musical notes. It converts musical notes to frequencies, and it allows you to synthesize songs. It's actually a really interesting problem set. And it's scaffolded. They give you details kind of the same way that you've done all these other problem sets. Seriously, we would have done this in class. We just didn't have time. But this is totally a legitimate independent project, and it'll take about the amount of time that a normal problem set would take. It's not too difficult, not too easy, kind of like right in the middle. Um, option three is if you want to do a different independent project, totally fine too, but you need to decide soon. So come see me or Mr. Apun. So you could build something off of the Google Maps API or off of CS50 Finance if you wanted to create your own sort of app that allows people to like sign up for stuff. If you want to use some of that as your starter code, that's totally fine as well. But if you want to propose an independent project, you just need to write it up like in an email or something. Come see one of us if you want to talk through it. But ultimately, we would want you to like write something up so that we know what you're agreeing to do. Um, you're going to submit it to Canvas. I don't have a Submit 50 link. But basically, the idea with the independent project is if it takes up about as much time as a problem set and you turn it in and it mostly works, we're going to give it credit. We're going to, give it, we're going to grade these on a credit, no credit basis. Basically, if you turn something in and it works pretty well, you get credit for it. Now, a credit, that credit will swap in for your lowest problem set grade in the fourth quarter, assuming you turned it in. So we, it won't make up for a zero. Like if you just didn't turn it in, you can't substitute the independent project for something you didn't turn in. But um, with that said, it counts as a 555. So it will be full credit. So anything you didn't get full credit on, you're going to get a higher score if you swap in the independent project. And we haven't done that many projects in the fourth quarter. So this, this has a serious chance to boost your grade. Just, uh, just going to say. All right, so that's the independent project. When is this due? It is due on senior skip day, essentially. So the 24th. And after that, we have to start grading. So I can't extend it beyond that. So there are no lates or tardies on this because I'm giving you as much time as I possibly can before I have to start grading it. Okay? Um, so that's the independent project. All right, so let's go on and take a look at Mashup. So 
when you download the mashup code and then you do Flask run on it, oh, let's see. Let me close this. I'm going to quit this and go to. So mashup comes down with a bunch of stuff. And if you say Flask run, oops, Flask run. I can't type. Wait. Why does it keep swapping that out? That's so weird. Thanks. OK. And then I open this up. This is what happens. It instantiates a Google map. It fills a Google map with stuff. And then it says it can't load Google Maps correctly. Um, I think because our API key is expired. But you can still, you can still do stuff. You just won't get normal, a normal feed from it. Um, if you go to CS50IE and you look at scripts, this is all of the JavaScript that makes the actual map run. So in JavaScript, because this application.py is Python, scripts.js is JavaScript, so you're all writing in JavaScript. Malin has a lecture on JavaScript and Ajax, which is required, so you, you really should watch that. But he's going to go over all of this stuff, like anonymous functions and the DOM model, stuff like that. Um, let is kind of like var. So I could say var map, but let map is better. Let has a more local scope. Var is more global. But generally try let, and only use var if, if let doesn't work. So generally let map basically is, sets up a variable called map. It declares it. It doesn't, it doesn't set it to anything yet. Uh, let markers equal this. This declares markers and initializes it to an empty array. This is where your markers are going to go. Um, and then let info equals new Google Maps info window. This creates a new info window that's going to be filled with stuff. I'm going to record this and make it available. So, um, OK. Then this stuff executes when the document object model is fully loaded. This dollar sign, that dollar sign is basically jQuery. So J-Q-U-E-R-Y, jQuery, is another framework that you're going to be using. Um, what is jQuery? If you Google it, you'll see that it's a lightweight framework that fits on top of JavaScript. And that's kind of what they're using to, to do a bunch of stuff here. Okay, It basically allows you to wrap HTML code in some of the ways that you're going to need to do it to interface with the Google Maps API. Um, these are all some different styles. This is basically, if you go to this URL, this will tell you, if you go here, this will tell you all the different features that you can use on a Google map. So for example, if I scroll down here, oops, you see where it says roadmap? If you change this to satellite and save it, we can open this up. And we'll see a satellite view. Wow. It is truly awesome. So um, the other thing that you can do too, like, is you can change, the, you can zoom out a little bit. And in fact, one of the things, like, this starts out centered on Stanford, California, but why not pick, you know, why not pick something a little bit more exotic? So if we go and we take a look at our um, database well, we open up the database in PHP Lite admin you can browse the database and this has all of the admin names right you have the admin name one admin code one so we can just find you know what's the latitude and longitude to someplace closer to home so we'll select, select star from places where admin code one equals hi. And we'll just execute that SQL search. And that'll pull up all the Hawaii locations. And we'll just scroll down to 96822, which is where we are now. Scroll over. And we'll just grab these two here. And then if I go over to scripts, I can just paste this in so that I don't lose it. 
and just replace the latitude. So I'd encourage you to change, you know, make it interesting. Change it to something that is some, anything that you want. It's, it's just got to be somewhere in the United States, otherwise you're not going to get um, articles. And then let's zoom it out a little bit. Let's zoom it out to like 10. I'm going to control S to save and then I'm going to reload. And there we have Oahu. Now there is some stuff that you can do. So this is another thing that I would that I would su suggest. If you right click on the map in Chrome and you choose inspect, you can actually see all of the errors that are showing up. So as you're debugging this and working with it, you can actually see the errors that that will turn up here. So you see this error here, you've exceeded your request quota for this API. So the API that was that was like hard coded in in scripts, I think it's in line 17. If you look here, somewhere somewhere in or maybe it's in help, I think it's in helpers. Index. Oh, it's an in index. All right, let's see index. Yeah, they they put the API key in right here. This is a Google Map API key. This key is baked in, but it's only good for like 500 queries a day. So I think we are exceeded. So that's why sometimes this returns values and sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on whether we've exceeded the request or not. So, but then the other thing is these error messages will come up. These are pretty useful when you make mistakes it will show up here. So use the inspector as well as the error messages in the actual in here to kind of figure out where these things are. So like, yeah, no such table because I haven't created some of this stuff yet. This red, this means there's a bad call. So again, when you're working with mashup, just read your error messages so that you kind of know where that stuff's coming from. Um, if we take a look at so this guided, this guided thing, it's okay if you don't understand everything the first time you go through, but you have to keep going back and reading this walkthrough because there's a lot of information in the walkthrough. Then we get to add marker. So add marker, basically there's a bunch of things that you need to do with add marker. Um, and I think Zamila kind of spells it out in her um, in her walkthrough, like the basic things that you need to do. Yeah, let's see. Oh, here it is. Okay. So in this to do, you should probably there's like five things that you need to do for AdMarker. So AdMarker is going to be pretty long. You also then need to do remove marker, and remove marker basically iterates through that markers array and just removes every marker in the array. That should not be that long. It should, it should be like four or five lines of code, if that. So don't spend it. If you find you're spending a ton of time on remove markers, come talk to one of us, because it may be that you're overthinking it. OK, this is very simple. Add markers, pretty complex. So most of the remaining work in Mashup happens in add marker. So basically, what you need to do is you need to create a new marker. And for that, um, Zamila, I think, suggests that you just basically go to the Google Maps API. And so you can just say Google Maps API add marker, API add marker. And you can go here to markers, maps, JavaScript API, and this will give you some code that will tell you, that will basically show you how to actually create a marker in a map. And so you should read this, right? Like read about what all of this stuff does. You may not understand everything that's in there, but you should look through here so that you at least kind of understand what's going on. Here's where we're creating a new marker. We're saying var marker equals new Google Maps marker. We're adding to it a position. The position takes the form of a dictionary. In JavaScript dictionaries, the keys don't have quotes. They're just the variable name, a colon, and then the value. Right? And then we set it to a certain, we set it to a map. 
and then if you want you can give it a title. So that's all useful information. This will be useful information as well. So you want to read through that and put that in as a marker. Then what you want to do is you want to listen for clicks on the marker. So everything basically is in, in this kind of app, everything's event-based. So stuff happens when people do things. Um, Scratch, we started the year with Scratch. Scratch is an event-based programming language. It just sits there and waits. So like on click, if this sprite is clicked, do this. So it just sits there, that script just sits there and waits. When someone clicks on the sprite, then it does something. Um, you know, same thing with, uh, yeah, when this sprite is clicked. So, you know, when green flag is clicked, that's all event-based stuff. So what you're doing here is you're waiting for that marker to get clicked on. And so I think one of the things in Zamila's walkthrough is she says, take a look at event.adlistener. So again, I'm going to Google event.adlistener, and that goes to the Maps JavaScript API in events. And you'll notice that it gives information on all of these UI events. And there's all different kinds of events, right? Like you can set something up so if you double click on it, it does something. Or if you mouse over it, it does something. You guys basically want click. Click is a mouse down followed by a mouse up really quickly. Mouse down, mouse up. That's a click. So when you have a click, then you're going to handle that event in some certain way. And so here's some information about how to add a listener to that button, to that marker, essentially. And when you click, it's going to call a certain anonymous function, essentially. And that function, remember that in JavaScript, some functions don't have names. They're just anonymous functions because you could pass a function in as a parameter argument for another function, but you don't give it a name. You just say function. Um, so for the next art thing you need to do is you need to get a list of articles. You need to get articles for place. So wherever the place is, when I click on that marker, that marker, whatever that represents, we got to go get a list of articles. What is waiting for you to check those articles? It's what you wrote in application.py because there's a route here for articles. So when you finish application.py, you will have written this thing. It's going to basically return a list of articles that's JSONified. Where does it return it to? Well, it returns it back here. Okay, so place essentially is geo, right? You're, you're looking for a list of articles for geo. Geo is communicated by ad marker. Um, that's gonna be a get JSON call. So if you scroll down here, I just want to show you. Um, they also talk about type ahead, by the way. And this is where you're actually using handlebars, which is a framework that allows you to sort of concatenate um, some Jinja code. So you're going to embed the place name, the admin code, and something else. That goes in this configure. And they basically tell you how to do it in um, the mashup specification. So just read through that. Um, See this get JSON call? Dollar sign, which now we know is jQuery dot get JSON slash search. Parameters function data text status JQ XR. You actually don't need to change this. That's just kind of set when you make a get JSON call. But what you do need to change is you need to change where it's going to, and you probably need to change the parameters. But you'll have to look up what does this get JSON thing really mean? And that is basically what you would use here when you get your articles for the place. Um, you then need to build a list of links to articles. And when they say build a list of links, essentially what they're doing is you're going you're gonna to call show info. And you're going to pop up a little window like here. This little window that pops up, that's show info. That's show info on the marker. This stuff, all of this, this is one long, like, unordered list. It's a UL tag followed by LI, 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 and then slash UL. So 
in this part where you're saying build a list of links to the articles, what you're really doing is you're basically constructing a long sort of text um, block. You're creating one string variable that corresponds to all of that HTML code. Kind of like you guys remember when you did index, you said, I think when you were doing a table in index, you said create a table and then you're like, okay, for every stock in stocks, create a new table row, so TR, TD, and then you ginger, you brought in those little things and then you're like slash TD, slash TR, and then it went and did the next stock, it opened up it again and then it printed it. So you know how you use that for loop in Jinja to iterate through and just you kept adding rows in HTML? It's kind of similar to what you're gonna do here. You're still gonna wanna have a for loop, but instead of adding it to an HTML field, essentially what you're doing is you're just gonna be adding it to a string. So you could say, let str equal this plus this plus this. Oops. So in JavaScript, you can concatenate strings together. So imagine like this could be something like this. This could be ul, right? This could be, you know, it could be anything, right? It could be Jinja stuff. Could be, could be actual text. But when you use the plus sign, you're concatenating it. You're putting it together. So string, str, will ultimately be this whole thing together as one string. That string, ultimately, is what you want to pass over to show window as content. Because I think show window, show info, takes a marker, the marker that you created. Content, that content is essentially the stuff that you passed in. Look at what it's doing here. Let div, so this is like var, right? Let div equal, this is HTML code, div ID info, if the type of content is undefined. In other words, if you didn't send anything in, if what you sent in was null, then div plus equals, div equals div plus IMG ALT loading, Ajax loader dot gif. This basically is what gets added to div if content doesn't have any content. Otherwise, they're gonna add the content that you give it. And then look, they say div plus equals slash div. So that's adding together this one long thing. So div will be one long text string that also includes the stuff that you put in. That one string that you passed in, content. So it probably should be, ultimately what you're gonna want is you're gonna want it to be div ul, li, blah, 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 li, li, slash ul, and then when you hand it off here, it's gonna close it with div, and then look at what it does here. It sets content to that, and then it opens map and marker. So set content, that's what sticks it to the marker. Making sense? Okay, so um, go back and watch this again if necessary. Um, with update, these parameters here, it creates something called NE, it creates something called SW, right? And this is function update. Look at this get JSON call. Get JSON slash update parameters. What's parameters? Look above. Parameters is this stuff. Now let's look back at application.py at what update looks like. Here's update. Finds up to 10 places within view. This should look familiar. If not request.arg.getsw, raise runtime error. This is like return apology, right? There's an error here. There's nothing for SW. If there was nothing in NE. Now SW and NE, they weren't fields in a form. They weren't arguments in a URL necessarily. They were sent in from scripts. from this. Parameters should get sent in here, and parameters should have these keys. It should have NE, and it should have SW. This is what request.args.get gets. It gets these parameters. Okay? So think about what articles should do. 
you're writing articles. Articles is supposed to get a series of articles for Geo. So Geo, Geo is going to need to get sent in from Add Marker using this kind of format. Um, and then finally, the last thing that you need to do is you need to um, remember the marker. And that marker essentially is just pushed right onto into markers. Okay, look at how to add stuff to an array in JavaScript. But essentially, you're just going to, every time add marker gets called, it just pushes it right into that markers array. Okay, um, and that is, that is it. That's basically what you need to do. Then, of course, you're going to want to check it for errors and, you know, scroll through and try to see where the problems. Um, if you ever get stuck, if you go over here to the file menu and you go to show revision history, this is a timeline that allows you to go back and see everything that you typed in, almost like a live, like a rewind. So like I could rewind all the way to the beginning if I wanted to and revert it. Or if you like have been writing for a while and something broke and you're like, hey, 20 minutes ago it worked, you can just scrub back 20 minutes, hit revert, and it'll just reset it back to what it was. Okay, so um, yeah, that, that would probably be uh, helpful for you guys to know. So um, yeah, all right, um, so that's about it. Good luck, let me know what help you guys need. And I will post this as well so you can uh, use this to look back on.